Good evening. Um, guys, do me a favor. As you're coming on, let me know that my sound is okay and that you can see me okay, that there's no technical issues. Um, I was just taking mentoring there and there was a weird sound in the background. Um, so, uh, guys, am I coming through okay? Just uh, let me know where you're coming in from. Say hi. Just uh, take a second right now and I'm just going to bring comments up on the big screen. Hold on a wee second. Let me mute myself over here and let me see the comments here. Um, so all good. Thank you, Cara. Um, guys, tonight we will be looking at a few things. So we will be looking at the uh, new bills that are coming out, the new laws that are coming out. Um, hiya, Sandra. Hiya, Mark. Hiya, Blue Stars. Hiya, Jackie. Hiya, Jax. Hiya, Cara. Hiya, uh, Good Shepherd. Guys, hiya. I have to say hi where you're, where you're coming in from as well. Let me know that you can hear me, see me, and uh, that I'm coming across okay. We will be looking at a lot of things tonight, and I want to take a second where we're at to ask you to do me the usual favor. If you can like, if you can share, if you can comment, um, if you can make sure that if you're on YouTube, the more comments, the better. Um, how you trust in God, how you salvation. Um, take the second and just comment away. And then as well, there's a lot more people on than there are likes. So if you can take a second to actually hit the like button, works wonders for us, pushes. If you get an opportunity just for a second, just share on your social media. There's a few things, right? My screen has gone, right? And I'm, I'm back here. Did I disappear for everybody there? Um, I'm just wondering, um, oh, hiya, Sonia. Um, I'm just wondering if, if, if I'm having technical issues again. I pray I don't. Um, only a blip, thank you. So tomorrow night we have on um, the great Pete Garcia. So Pete Garcia is on tomorrow night with myself. We will be going through um, conspiracy and different things and how um, the Bible sort of counters conspiracy or perhaps the idea of conspiracy theory being a term used as a smokescreen to stop people seeing prophecy um, and to stop people seeing biblical prophecy converge. So tonight we will be talking about things such as the Irish hate speech bill. We have talked about this briefly before, but we'll be talking about it in how you Julie, how you do? Um, we'll be talking about it in terms of a lot of different things. We'll be talking about a lot of different bills. And I want to sort of kick off with, um, I guess, a scripture. We're going to go into a scripture first off. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20. And the context of that is that God gives us freedom while the enemy enslaves. But the actual um, scripture says for you were bought at a price so we were bought at a price a very high price but that word bought there is agorzado right in the greek is agorzado which actually means to purchase a slave out of the slave market or to transfer ownership from a seller to a buyer or another way of putting it that we can all agree with to redeem so we've been bought with the price of redemption we have been taken out of the slave market because this is what I want to point out straight away is the enemy wants to enslave. And I'm going to show you through history, church history as well, and as well with these current bills and these current laws, um, that there is a concerted demonic effort to try and take away religious liberty. Liberty that is found in Christ because who the sun sets free is free indeed. So liberty is found in Christ and the enemy is continually trying to chip away at that liberty uh, to take it back, to take it down, to bring us back into a place of being in that slave market. But we have been agorzado, we have been bought at a price, we have been set free. So as such, that gives the church, the remnant church, a commission in these times, right? If you're set free from the system, if you're the Neo of the Matrix, right, you're set free from the system, you're no longer a slave to the system, then your job is to set others free, the Great Commission. Does this make sense? Hit one if this makes sense, guys. 
so I want to look at scripture here and again the more comments comment the way uh, if you're going to ask questions tonight put questions all in caps it makes it easier for me to find um, if you're asking for prayer requests again prayer all in caps so this thing that we're looking at right now this uh, the difference of these bills coming out the difference of these uh, things happening I want you to understand that they have a place in history Ecclesiastes 3 says that there is nothing nothing new under the sun and what we know about prophecy is specifically in terms of biblical prophecy prophecy is pattern and it, what happens before will happen again and the term is modine and it literally talks about the intensification of things so if you picture this coil that once it gets to a crescendo point the fulfillment of full prophecy I've given the example before 168 BC Antioch Epiphanes is a foreshadow of the Antichrist Nebuchadnezzar statue a foreshadow of the image of the beast all of these different things are foreshadows in the past but they will culminate in the fulfillment of scripture hiya Pete and so whenever you look at this whenever you understand that the Moedim pattern of prophecy is outplaying before us. You can look through history and you can say, has there been concerted efforts in history to try and usurp our freedom, the religious freedom, the, the freedom that was found in Christ and take it back? And we know that there is. We know, for instance, that in the 1500s, that the following um, Henry VIII, there was a concerted effort by the, the church in the UK, the church in England, to move away from Rome. And as they were moving away from Rome, one of the things that they did, which was amazing, is they gave us the Bible in print to read. And so under Henry VIII, there was this idea that, now I'm not saying Henry VIII is a good guy, just listen for a second, right? Under Henry VIII, um, there was this ability to, now the common man, if you could read, and if you can read English, you could have read the Bible in Old English. However, under the monarchy's advice and under the dictate of Henry VIII, he didn't want that to be full freedom. So whilst there was this idea of having freedom uh, in the sense that you're free to re read the scriptures, he brought out and he wanted to bring out, um, and he, it was later brought out under Edward, King Edward uh, V or the Sixth, I think it is, in 1549 and it was brought out as an accompanying pamphlet or document to your faith now this is how every cult works right the co the company and document was the uniformity of common prayer and this was brought out because you weren't able to in the 1500s you weren't able to communicate and to pray to god you weren't able to pray according to uh how jesus instructs us in the word you weren't able to do that so the state wanted to control that and says these are the prayers that you're going to pray so although we had freedom under the reformation to we had freedom um following henry VIII's split with rome we had freedom to read the word the freedom was curtailed because the thing is, is that if you have true freedom, you start to walk in freedom and that upsets power. And power wants to concentrate. Power wants to be brought back into this centralized position. Does this make sense? Um, so you had this in the 1500s and it, it continued on from there, right? We had the uniformity of common prayer, but it is basically broken down. It is a strategy to control. Now, if you look at the UK, for instance, right now, you will see this strategy of control in play. In fact, not just the UK, in Australia, in the US, all the way around the world, um, in, in the south of Ireland, you will see this in play. For instance, the United Kingdom, um, following, uh, I think it came into play last year, they had changed the right to protest. So there was a right to protest. There is a right to protest. There's a right to protest in our fundamental freedoms. However, I want to, I want to sort of paint a picture here, so stay with me. The right, the right to protest needs to be curtailed for power to be centralized because we saw it under um, C-19 that whenever C-19 came in and people came out and protested, it went against government narrative and that's upsetting. 
So they brought in this law, this bill, um, to curtail the right to protest. And it went through amendments in the House of Lords, went back to the House of Commons. And basically, uh, to break it down, if you're um, attending a gathering and you have anything that is classed as a restraint, whether that's uh, the, the, the straps of a bag, then you can be arrested. Now, this is true. This is I've looked, I've went through this. This is true. You can be arrested for that. If you are carrying a rape whistle, um, you can be arrested going to a protest. In fact, under this new bill, the main thing is is that the government will say, "Yeah, you got a right to protest, but we prefer you did it at home and you were quiet about it." You see, this goes back. This is his, there's a historical precedent for this, and it is the curtailing of power into centralized form. It is whenever uh, the the enemy and the spirit behind these things doesn't want people walking in freedom that Christ has set for us. So right now, what we have in the UK is we have this bill. In Australia, you can face, uh, I think, three months imprisonment for causing um, what they say a disturbance in a public place. But again, there's no classification on what a disturbance is other than the fact that Hey, you're annoying us. Just stop, right? Um, guys, am I still streaming? Okay, is everything coming through? Okay, the sound and the the because I've been having technical difficulties, but I've been praying, so uh, I'm just believing it's okay now. So just let me know I'm coming through. Then you've got the Canadian hate hate speech bill, the C three six seven C dash three six seven bill, which carries an inordinate um, amount of time in prison on the back of this hate speech act. And then that brings us to the Irish hate speech bill. So we've been looking at what's been happening uh, in, in this island for the past sort of few months. There was the referendum there that um, the Irish government put in play uh, to try and redefine what, ma what the family is, to redefine the family. And it was quite re resoundingly defeated in the referendum. However, one of the things that we seem to notice is that there seems to be, a, in a lot of countries, including Ireland, there seems to be a concentrated elite in power who are not really concerned with what the, the public think. In fact, it goes into sort of a mentality of seeing everybody else as rednecks and themselves as elite and set apart. And we've seen this in play with this referendum. We've seen the fact that the hate speech bill went through a public poll and I think 70% of the population were against it. And as 70% of the population were against it, the uh, result or the, the sort of response of the Irish government was, well, they don't know what they're talking about. Or, you know, it wasn't a big enough poll or we didn't speak to the right people, that sort of thing. And this still, this hate speech bill, although it's in the, um, the higher house right now, and it's to go back to the lower, um, which is kind of like the House of Commons and the House of Lords in the UK. What's happening with this hate speech bill is it's already been resoundingly um, agreed upon in the lower house. I think 120 out of 160 um, yes votes, right? So a resounding support for this hate speech bill. A hate speech bill, by the way, which does not define what hate speech is. There was, I listened to one solicitor talk on this and he had said um, there was uh, one attempt to define what hate speech was and the, the actual definition that they came up with was hate is hatred. And which you think, right, okay, I can't cope with the moronic, that's just crazy. And the, the, the problem being with this, right, so you've got the Irish, Southern Irish government, you've got the Northern Irish government, and they are separate. But we are seeing a constant kind of removal from what the public or the populace want to go along with an elite ideal, kind of back like back to ancient history or even medieval history in which the rulers know better and you guys are just peasant folk. OK, um, I find this fascinating. Hiya, Janice. Hiya, Ivan. Um, guys, it is, yeah, it's moving towards a one world government and we know it's going that way. But I find it a kind of this is one of the things I know that there's a lot of people who believe in like the NAR idea of 
uh, like the New Apostolic Revolution, Revol New Apostolic uh, Revelation, the, those idea of sort of dominionism and the church will take this back and swing away darkness. Now, I personally don't see that in scripture because scripture tells us that things will unfold this way. But there's also an answer in this for us. And the answer I believe for what we're seeing is found in history. But to carry on, look at the laws that are continuing right now. Now, whilst we are seeing the likes of um, the US government looking at banning TikTok, because apparently TikTok, the Chinese state ran or the Chinese state influenced uh, media platform is spying on people. I find it fascinating that, you know, you're having a government come along and say, let's ban TikTok. But yet every other social media platform is doing the same thing. Facebook's doing it, uh, YouTube's doing it, um, Instagram's doing it, they're all doing the same thing. The difference being is you have to understand the spirit behind all of this. The spirit behind all of this is the accumulation of data. Data is the new gold, data is the new silver, data is the new currency, and the more data is received, the more powerful the nation is. And what you will see, this will all, like somebody said there, this will all become a case of global governance but at the minute there's this data sort of struggle going on and it's not to forget that for Europe Ireland is the center house for the likes of LinkedIn Facebook Instagram they have the center that the, their center offices are here and so when they have all of this you have to understand that there's a, a cooperation between the social media giants and this new neoliberal approach that seems to be anything but biblical and the, the point to this guys the point to this that i see is that everybody in those elites they seems to be they seem to be singing uh off the same hymn sheet and the hymn sheet is let's reject the moralistic code of the past and let's move in a different direction now we saw this, right? If you go back to 2018, 2019, 2018, Ireland adopted um, ab abortion, uh, Northern Ireland had abortion, you know, the, all of these things started to come into play. Abortion uh, went to countries like Argentina, all the way around the world and just started to, to um, I know I'm gonna be censored for using that word. I, should cut, I need to learn the rules about trigger words. Um, but, all of this these bills these laws are going in defiance of what the word says you know we've had in northern ireland we've had uh since um i don't i actually that's ireland in ireland they've had same-sex um union or marriages since 2015. um in northern ireland we've seen the increase of uh the abortion bill going from 20 to 24 weeks um and we're seeing all of these things come into place but the whole point to it and the strategy to it like i said is to center power and to have a populace conform okay have a populace conform and i want to go back into like i said i want to look at this through history and i want to look at different things that we see and like i said henry the eighth brought it you know brought out the fact that we could have um the ability to read in the under james we had the king james bible and you could read the bible but you couldn't have the freedom of what the bible brings because you still had to conform to state and here's the thing that i'll, I'll remind you of in the end times there will be two separate churches in these times there's two separate churches growing there's the remnant believing church who holds to the word of god and there's the state-run church but like I said, the Moedim shows us that this is something not new, but something that has come through history, right? It has happened through history. So if you go back to likes of 1665, in 1665, you had a thing called the Five Mile Act. Um, I, the Five Mile Act uh, is the idea that you couldn't preach within five miles of a time without government approval. Now, this was back in 1665 because they, they realized, right, we've given the, the peasant folks the word of God and the word of God sets them free. But we don't want them to be so free that they get a, a ahead of their station and they don't they don't uh, conform to our way of doing things. They don't conform to what we tell them is right. And so 
this Five Mile Act came in, and the Five Mile Act um, basically restricted the, the preacher and where they can go. Now, if you want to think back on modern day terms, think back to 2020. Think back to the fact that you were, like, certainly over here, we were restricted to a mile from our house. Um, there was the, the, the rule that you could only leave your house for an hour a day, and there, you could only go a mile. Now, that's a, a modern day picture of this, that the Five Mile Act was something of his, history. But remember, the Moadim coil is turning and things are getting more and more intense. Now, if you go back a year before that, there was also the Conventicle Act. Now, the Conventicle Act of 1664 was slightly different. Now, what it forbade through the Conventicles, what it defined uh, what religious assemblies could be. And it didn't allow people to assemble more than five at a time. Now, does that, now, certainly I don't know the rules because we've got a lot of different countries on here. I don't know what the rules were where you were, but certainly here, the rules, and I, yeah, I don't, I don't believe in conforming, but these were the rules that they were trying to stipulate. And we had placed our, uh, we had placed to the house, to our family house, my mom's house. We had placed to the church. Um, so we, we, we had that. And the, the thing is, is that they were, they put the rules on about how you can meet and how you, where you can preach. You can't go into the town. You can't go into the cities. Remember, I said this last week when we were talking, I said, that the word in Hebrew is ear, right? Um, and it means city. And if you trace it back in its etymology, it goes right back to the Hebraic form of awake and watching, and it goes back to the Aramaic form for watcher. So it's kind of like in the spiritual sense, the watchers that are associated with the congregation and par centralizing in a city form, don't want the, the, the speaking of truth in those areas. And we would certainly find that nowadays where you go and speak truth. And we witness and we have people witnessing the parades on uh, Sunday and we witness in the town. But at the same time, that is certainly a different atmosphere. Like I live in the country now and it's a different atmosphere here than it is to when we go into the city centre. And people will often say, people in the area, that when they drive in, they just feel a heaviness. And that I believe that there is a spiritual connotation to this. But remember, the spiritual connotation of the principalities and powers will affect the rulers of the age. And back in 1664, the Conventicle Act, I believe that if you look at 2020, it's like they were writing, they were doing a history project and somebody said, wouldn't this be a good idea? Let's shut the churches. Let's stop the preachers preaching in this, these areas. Let's forbid them from gathering. In fact, let's give them... Uh, only a certain amount where it won't really make a difference. Um, so guys, does this, does this, um, hiya groomer gal, gal hiya Jax. Um, yeah, it's the watchers of Daniel 4, 17. It is, it's, it's what um, we see in the in Daniel 4 with Nebuchadnezzar, the watcher, Ayer, um, or the pronunciation is ear, right? So when we look at this, you can see this through history. You can see the Conventicle Act. You can see the um, the Five Mile Act. But if we go further in this, I want to show you this. And let again, if you've got questions, please get ready with your questions. When it went to, to 1714, that's when they brought in the Riot Act. Now, the Riot Act, again, would be likened to the idea of congregating. And now what we're seeing is laws in Australia, laws in different places. We saw the trucker convoy in Canada. We saw the laws that are brought in in the UK about um, protesting. And these laws are in effect. Now, that doesn't mean that there won't be protests. If there are protests that suit the government narrative, they will let them happen. But if there are protests that don't, they're under attack and it's with all of this i want you to understand that the attack and the heart behind this is to come against the church the attack is upon the church when you look at what has happened in finland in finland there was a lady who was a, a part of the uh finnish government and she had in private message over whatsapp said something and she had rebuked the lutheran church's support of a pride event and as such, she's now um, 
been in court and their case has now reached the Finnish Supreme Court and all of this because she stood on her faith. Now the whole part, part to bring this back to these, this hate speech uh, bill in Ireland, to bring this back to the hate speech bill in Canada, what defines hate speech? And the only definition I can find when trailing through all the information on this is anything that is against what they see as a protected grouping. Now, that doesn't include religious freedom in this. What this is about is if I turn around and say there are only two genders, that there are only, uh, there's only one way to heaven, that um, I don't do agree in the deletion of children or the deletion of a human being, that if I, if I speak any of this out, that qualifies as hate speech under the ambiguity of this law. And like I said, it's in the higher house right now, but when it goes back to the lower house, I would be surprised if it is not passed. I would be very, very surprised. And that is coming, and that, this is what I wanna say, for all the churches out there, for all the, the pastors, you better be ready because the world is going into a stage of complete and utter deception, but also the, the re, bringing back to centralized power. And that means that we've I, we've already seen um, in the streets here, and I'm sure on the streets in the UK, and I'm sure you've seen it where you are, pastors, preachers on the street being um, either arrested or being taken away or being harassed. And the people who harass them tend to be the ones that are looked after. Like we had, I've said this story before, um, we had some guy, there was a guy over here, he was at the church recently, preaching on the street and we had a full um, rainbow sort of guess gathering around him and someone came out and started ripping up a bible in front of him and the only person who came and stood in the way the police force that were fine with that you know go and rip up the bible that's absolutely okay was a guy from our street church we do a street church where we go out and we witness to homeless and we pray with them, we sing with them and we feed them and all of that stuff. And this was the only guy who, a homeless individual that we know, a friend of ours, was the only guy who stood up and the police moved him off. Now, this is not against the police or anything like that, by the way. This is not against that. This is against the centralized laws that are being put in place to now make what it was good evil and what is evil good, Isaiah 520. Does this make sense? Guys, um, are, is anybody else, does, does anybody else find that this in, is in their area, that you're experiencing it where you are? Because I believe 2024 will mark an acceleration in this. I believe it's marking an acceleration in this. We are going to see power trying to come back into that centralized place. And as it tries to come back into that centralized place, you're going to see people ministers, preachers imprisoned. You're going to see people have to actually stand for their faith. And in the West, we haven't been used to that. And I know there's the odd case, but we haven't been used to that in the West. But I want you to now look to history. You know, I want you to look to history for a little bit of strength from this. I want you to look to history and go, right, okay, is there anybody in history who stood against power in this way and stood on their faith? Well, in um i think it was oh, I'm trying to remember the um in about the 1630s there was an individual um who stood against um james well it was probably about the 1620s he stood against james and he stood against james the first and he wanted full religious liberty and whenever he was imprisoned, his name was John Merton. And if you know this story, you can tell me. But uh, John Merton was imprisoned and he was taken away. He was locked up. And the way it was in, those, in uh, that era, certainly in England, in prisons, is that you didn't tend to get fed by the prison. You didn't get nourishment from the prison. You got nourishment from someone on the outside who kind of missed you. So what John Merton did in the midst of going to prison, basically for his faith that he should have full religious liberty, not liberty to say, right, you can read the word, but you can't say certain things. You know, don't read Romans one out loud because we'll throw you in prison, that type of thing. OK, he wanted full religious liberty to say, look, I'm going to follow my Lord and I'm going to preach and teach the word of God as it is. 
Um, th does anybody know the story of John Merton? Um, so the story is, is that he goes to prison and as he goes to prison, he keeps his pamphlets going. So what happens is he has his um, visitors, his friends uh, come along with uh, the milk. So they come along with milk for him. And instead of having a cork in the top of the milk, they have a rolled up parchment that is placed in the top of the milk and they give it to him. And what he did, would do is he would find a splinter, dip it in the milk and then on the unroll the parchment and write out his pamphlet, his good news message, the message of the truth of scripture. And he would write it out and then he would roll it up. And the next day his uh, friend would come back with another milk and another parchment and he would give him the empties. And the friend would go back and hold the, open up the parchment and hold it over a candle. And what would happen is the milk the residue of the milk would dry and it would turn brown and they could decipher what he wrote. And so he took that and then they would take it and they would print off the pamphlets. And it was it was known as the milk of the word. Right. And it would get the truth out there, even in the midst of confinement. And I guess what my message is with this is that even as Paul said, Paul called himself and identified himself as an ambassador in chains. Right. When we, when the world closes in on us, whenever liberties and, and freedoms are taken and what is put in place is authoritarianism and dictatorship and mob rule and political correctness in place and social uh, idealism in place of Christianity. Whenever that happens, the Christian has to be ready to do a Matthew 10, 16, to be as wise as serpent and, uh, serpents and as harmless as doves, to operate and don't go, well, I'll just keep myself in the corner and be quiet. You know, I was talking, and, and some of you heard me talking on Sunday, I was talking to, and had an interview with uh, my friend Josh Peck, and I was having the interview, and I did, made the mistake, and I said this, of reading comments afterwards, because it's the human mentality not to focus in on the 90% of positive comments, but to just gravitate towards the negative. And one of the negatives, and I'm not harping on about this, but I believe it's relevant, that was that I'd taken my family to these uh, relic places, these places that are associated with darkness, that I shouldn't take them there because that's like uh, taking my family to a strip club or taking them to uh, a place of debauchery. And my argument was this, was this, was no, we are to occupy the space. Exodus 20 verse 24 says that wherever the name of God is recorded, his Hashim is recorded, he will be there. And whenever we sit back and recline back in the corner and say, oh, no, well, we're being told that we can't say this in public. We're being told that we can't preach Romans 1. We're being told that we can't speak out truth. We're being told. So what, what we'll do is we'll just hide in the corner and keep our Christian faith private and separate and just go along with what the state says. Well, there's a problem with that. That basically classifies us as not followers of Christ, but followers of everything but Christ. That's it. You know, I said this before that, look, you're not born again by a prayer. There is no such thing in the scripture as a believer's or a sinner's prayer. Now, does that mean that it's wrong to pray it? No, pray it, right? I pray it. But what qualifies you as a Christian is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But then we have to follow him. He says, pick up your cross and follow me. So if we go, oh, well, you know what? I believe in Jesus Christ, but Jesus, you go out and you stand against the world and overcome the world. And I'm just going to hide away from the world. Well, then there's a problem with that. OK, because all you're saying is that your belief that Jesus is who he says he is and who the Bible says he is. And that qualifies you as a Christian. There is a problem with that because even the demons, as James points out, they believe. What qualifies us is, is the fact that, one, we're not qualified through anything we do at all. We're saved by grace through faith. But we have to, there has to be an evidence in the sense of who we are. If I identify as a Christian, um, if I identify as a follower of Christ, I've got to do what? I've got to follow him, right? Christ, who stood against tyranny. Whenever the, the, the religious people of today says, 
be quiet, stop saying these things, stop getting the people riled up. And Christ said no, and he kept preaching the truth of the word because he is the word. Then we too have to follow in that example. We can't hide away in the corner. We have to do what the likes of John Merton did and actually say, right, okay, we may be shut down out of this sphere. They may try and close us down in this way and close us down in that way, but we can be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. And we can navigate this time in this season and know that we're still to stand for righteousness and keep preaching truth in Jesus name. Guys, am I, am I the only one or does this, does this rattle some feathers? Does this sort of uh, ruffle some feathers? Does this sort of, um, hopefully you're, you're getting what I'm saying. Um, hopefully it's coming through okay. But guys, I believe that there is a concerted effort right now in the world through every government and like i said it seems like they're singing off the same hymn sheet and i would um suggest that this hymn sheet comes from the highest elevated town in europe davos which i say i qualify in the sense that isaiah 14 the enemy wants to usurp god by going to the highest point above god and dethroning god by going to that high point the same satanic strategy that we see come out of davos is to take the Bible and throw it out the window and actually put their ideals and their thinking above everything else. And it, it, it's seen in history, but the people of history, the John Mertons, the, the John Bunyans, the, the, the different people, the, the John Wycliffs, the, you know, the people who stood against this, right? They are our example. And we cannot afford to be latticing in approach. And you might go, well, you know what? There's no other church standing with us. And this church is over here saying, you know, grace, 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 hyper grace, hyper grace, hyper grace, do what you want. That's okay. Be like the world. Do You know, you can ignore that. What the Bible says is one will chase a thousand and two will chase 10,000. It's not about the numbers with us. It is about who is in us. Does that make sense, guys? It is about who is in us. And we have got to start walking in authority because, listen, the, the lawmakers will continually try and restrict this. And what they're trying to do is take these laws under their own control so they can say that person is a, a, a hate speech propagator and that person is a, a menace to society and we just want to remove them. And by the way, I don't think for one minute that we haven't been identified throughout the last four years, right? The last four years, we have seen the increase of artificial intelligence. We have seen the increase of surveillance state. We have seen the increase of, it's not just TikTok, it's Facebook, it's, it's all of them. We've seen the increase of observance and, and monitoring. Do you think for one minute they don't know who the troublemakers are? And I think probably one of the biggest identifications that they put upon troublemakers in this sense, people that they need to make laws against are those that speak the fundamental truth of scripture. That's why you heard the likes of Pope Francis come out and say, fundamentalist Christians are a scourge on society. Something that was repeated, uh, the rhetoric that was repeated by Joe Biden, the, the United States president. And you see that why because the target is put upon them the target is put upon us that's why you hear the term uh christian nationalists being sent out and said continually uh, trying to identify um christians and those who believe in the word of god as somehow uh, being a derogatory term and it happened as well when we saw black lives matter listen guys do, do, let me just see if i've got any photos here for this I want you to understand as well, there is a relation between all of this and what we're seeing going on in the world right now. So let me see if that's right. So right now we have, I need to remove that banner. Hold on, bear with me, technical difficulties. What was that, John Merton? Yeah, I'll remove that now, here we go. Right now we see the likes of, in Ireland, uh, in Dublin, tent city now tent city is where all of the immigration like the people coming in from uh syria afghanistan uh pakistan um the people coming in and they're living in tents in the street and we have seen these continually um 
you know, and we've we've seen the response of the the governments to uh, the response of the government is to open up this as a, a I guess an avenue, you know, like keep it going. This is something that we're in for, but there was we're for, but the response of the population has been uh, generally against this because you know there's defecation in the streets and so on and so forth and this is tent city right now why am i bringing this up in connection with the likes of these laws well one of the things that is being brought in here within the hate speech laws if you're out there and you're talking about uh, and in what is not a glowing term mass illegal immigration and you're not talking about it in a glow uh, a glowing term a glowing um slant then that will classify as hate speech and i guess what it carries between two to five years imprisonment over here two to five years imprisonment or, or what about when you see them in uh, coming across in texas and, and and what about when you see them coming across the borders in america that again the idea here is that you water down the culture so it becomes an excuse now let me break this down very very quickly this is in essence machiavellianism okay so machiavellianism is the concept divide uh you know that we saw in italy uh six seven hundred years ago we saw in italy and the idea between with machiavellianism was that you cause chaos and as you cause chaos you come around the the and you give a half convoluted answer. Machiavellianism is where Hegelian dialectics or Marxist ideology is built upon. The idea that you create an issue, right? You create this issue, whether this issue is mass immigration, whether this issue is social unrest and social discord, you create a whole load of issues where everybody starts protesting. Then you come around the, the, the front and you say, well, we can fix this issue by taking away some of your powers so you can't protest anymore. And you go, well, those people who have been protesting, I didn't agree with what they were protesting about. So yeah, go ahead with it. This is Hegelian dialectics, right? This is how socialism is built. This dates back to Machiavellianism. Uh, the historian William Federer de defines it like this. Machiavellianism is like going around the back of the house, setting it on fire, then coming around the front of the house and selling the homeowner a fire extinguisher. You, you come along with a half convolute, convoluted answer or to the problem that you've created. So you open the borders, you open the borders in America, you open the borders around the world, you open the borders in Europe, you open the borders in Ireland, and people flood in. And then you see protests and then you go, well, you know what? All these protests, we need to shut them down. Let's bring in legislation that will shut down protests. Let's bring in legislation that will shut down this. And um, each part of those legislative um, actions are to take away power and again, it is against the church and i'm sorry i know i will be censored for this but it is against the church right it is because what is more conservative than the, the views of the bible what is more central to the beliefs is that of how we walk than if we apply the ten commandments and we apply the commandments that jesus hangs the ten commandments on and we apply them in their entirety and that will be seen as hate speech soon just like we when we read out romans 1 and it's seen as hate speech just like when we quote uh first corinthians 6 and it's seen as hate speech just like when we talk about the book of revelation and not even the churches want to go near it right what i'm saying is is that they create the chaos and the problem and then they bring around a, an answer but the trade-off for the answer is your freedom the trade-off is continual freedom like in America right now, 17 states are having a measles outbreak. We know about this, yes? I'm sure my American friends do. Um, in America right now, there are 17 states that are having a measles outbreak. Now, measles is generally, now I want to show you this because it's a strategy. Measles is generally seen as one of the highest um, transmissible infectious infections right so it's very very transmissible people get sick very very quickly from it now it is not fatal right now what you're hearing the mainstream media turn around and say is that you know it's because people aren't taking the v for uh measles right i have to be careful what i say they aren't taking the the inoculation for measles but 
measles lost its mortality rate in the 1950s and the V for measles didn't come out till the 1960s. And what they have found in connection with this measles outbreak is it tends to be having its source outbreak in sanctuary cities, in cities that are housing loads of people coming through. Why? Because in the countries of origin, they won't have the same Medicare, they won't have the same medical system. So they are coming in and now this measles is breaking out. So what you listen to then is the answer. Create the chaos, come around with an answer that seems half as good, but the trade-off for the answer is your freedom. So the answer to that, and you're hearing it from the mainstream media, it's, it's because of a lack of vaccine uptake. So this is now in favour of the pharmaceutical industry, who are turning around saying, yes, we've got a measles outbreak, so we need to have more inoculations, more money, more dollar signs, blah, 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 and everybody goes along with it. So what I'm saying to you is, is that if you're looking at the state of the world right now and you're looking how things are happening, you're looking at the attack upon the ability to protest, the attack upon moralistic structure of the Bible, you're at the attack on the word of God, the attack upon speaking the word of God in public. Not so long ago, and I spoke about it on here already, that a, a young girl in England was um, accosted by an officer because she was singing a hymn on the street. And as she was singing a hymn on the street, the officer came up and said, you cannot sing those words outside of church grounds. And we have seen, like I said, preachers arrested for preaching the word of God, for reading the word of God in public. It is all going down one route, but take the example of history. We stand against this, how? because we have the, the John Merton approach to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves, not the car into the corner, but to know that we were made for such a time as this, to know that we are equipped for such a time as this, and to know that no weapon formed against us can prosper. So guys, I'm gonna ask you right now, if you have questions, type, um, If you, yeah, you're the Holy Spirit will reprimand you every single time you walk into sin, it will. If you have questions, um, throw your questions up with uh, the word question, please. And it just makes it easier. Um, if there is anything, I can't see anything right now. If there is anything to see it. So, guys, if you've got a question or you've got a prayer request, please throw it up right now. Um, uh, we are too busy with God's work regardless. God is always with us. And for me, I don't want even my worst enemy to go to hell. Amen. It shudders me even thinking anyone be, would be left behind. I am in exactly, I'm in ag agreement with you, Kathy. I believe that entirely. It is something that provokes me. It is something that rocks me and shakes me. And it always leaves me with that feeling, am I, am I doing enough? Not for a case of attaining my own salvation, because I can't do that, I'm not saved by works, but rather, am I doing enough to see those that I know come to Christ? Um, is the WHO Treaty, or the, let me just throw it up here. Hold on. Okay, is the WHO Treaty, the WHO Treaty being ratified this May? If so, is that basically one world government in place? Um, it seems to be going that direction, right? Um, it seems to be going in the direction of full acceptance. If you looked, there was initial um, resistance from some of the African countries, but then now it seems to have been pushed in either way. And certainly the countries that are on board with it are the big players like the UK, the US and so on. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it's going to be ratified. It's going to be put into action in this May, or certainly agreed upon. The amendments will be agreed upon in May, and it will probably take to the end of the year before that sort of starts to come into play. But does that mean a one world government? Um, no, but it's the framework for it. It is certainly the usurping of national sovereignty into, and it's that again, it's again that control, bring everything into one central place. Um, it's not full on one world government yet because there's still national identity.
kind of certain I disappeared right why have I disappeared I'm back okay I'm back <laughs> right can you hear me okay let me know you I, I can see questions come up can you hear me okay can you see me okay let me know please um yeah thank you Marcella so um I think this is the, the, the first major step Julie a first major step um and I would say it's certainly well it's not worrying to the church because we know what's happening but it's worrying for national freedom it's worrying for where we're at um it's not worrying to the christian because we we know where we're at we know what's happening but yeah i think that um i think that we're going in this direction and i think that may and certainly what follows and proceed sort of comes off the back of may will be very very telling Kara's asked um what i think of Keir starmer as he said that he wants assisted dying to be legalized after the last election. It doesn't surprise me. Now, I'm not impressed by Keir Starmer in any way, shape or form. Um, I don't think that we have a, a great prime minister in Rishi Sunak, but I don't think Keir Starmer would be any better in, in any way. Um, I think it might be um, further down the rabbit hole. The, the idea of assisted dying, like our Canadian friends know what this is about and know how this is. I think, like I said, they all, every major government that is initiating these types of legis legislation, all seem to be singing off the same hymn sheet, which all seems to be from the vocal cords of Klaus Schwab and Yuval Noah Harari. And I think that, yeah, it's certainly telling. Um, it's certainly telling of where we're at, and maybe we can speak a bit more with that with Pete tomorrow. Um, let me just wait for us to come up on the big screen so I can see it. Uh, wow, good question. Uh, will the spiritual realm be totally visible during the tribulation? Um, I know where you're, you're sort of thinking like isn't that um that's a great question jack that is really um i don't know i know that when we see the likes of revelation 9 um there certainly seems to be this idea that you can identify these demons coming out of the pit from abaddon um the the locust shaped demonic horde that comes out and then we see the identification of frog spirits and so on that is a very interesting concept and i'll be honest i've never thought of that before um i it's it's i i certainly think there will be horrors to be seen and you will certainly like well we won't but the tribulation saints will certainly see uh what can only be described as miraculous um, what can only be described as supernatural you know you've got the two witnesses coming back from the dead that type of thing as well um yeah i i the more i think about it and i've never actually thought about it before but the more i think about it i would probably lean towards yes um i don't know if it'll be totally visible i would suggest that when we talk about the um the current unrebelled or non-rebellious non -rebellious heavenly host, as in the angelic ones who serve God, I can't see there being a gleam of hope during the tribulation in that way, shape or form. I think that what they'll be, their eyes will be open to is certainly the demonic, you know. I hope that sort of helps or I hope that answers that. Um, let me see if I missed anything. My, is it moving um let me just go to comments there layers have i missed anything um yeah i don't think i've missed any questions there if i have i apologize um i can't i can't see them unfortunately i've got a smaller screen on this side so it's kind of it's more difficult but um hopefully i've answered those as best as i can anyway um guys tomorrow night we have uh pete garcia um pete was on earlier with us there uh so we have pete garcia and myself and we'll be going through um 
conspiracy theory. We'll be going through the idea of conspiracy theory or biblical reality. We'll be go talking about things like that. Um, and next week as well, we have Derek Gilbert coming on from Skywatch TV 5 and 10, uh, View from the Bunker. And we have Mondo Gonzalez on next week as well from Prophecy Watchers. So we've got um, a lot lined up and I am trying, this is my heart, um, to give you as much as I possibly can in the sense of great teachers of the word of God who will not um, filter it down for tickling ears sick. And that's why we're bringing these guys on. Um, Hold on, there is a question, but I have to find it on this screen to be able to see it properly. This is unfortunate, right? Hold on. Okay, and let me see if I can read it on this big screen before the big screen goes. Um, when hell is thrown into the lake of fire in Revelation 20, does that mean we go back to Eden and hell is destroyed? Um, well, in Revelation 20, when, when, when at the end of the millennial reign, you'll see the, the sort of, I guess, complete finishing of Satan. Uh, you'll see the complete finishing in the sense that there's this time for people to uh, choose God, love God, uh, follow God. And there's also that free will element. Free will doesn't go out the way. Will we return to Eden? I think yes in a sense but not eden as it was i think it'll be more i think it'll be uh well certainly new the new jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth will be um something spectacular um it will be a case it will be i think it'll return to eden in the sense as well but that we don't see death and we don't see the i guess fractious activity between species where animal eats animal and instead what we'll see is you know um i remember i think it was don perkins talking about this before and i remember him talking about you know what pet will you have in heaven what pet will you have in the new jerusalem in the new heaven in the new earth will you be on the back of a lion you know it, it, it's amazing to think about but i think yes i would say, say it like a um a new Eden. Will hell be destroyed? Well, I believe that hell is basically a, a place of eternal torment. Um, that's, that's a very interesting question because, you know, we know, though, that Satan is not in hell. Satan is roaming around this world. And we know that when we get to the end of Revelation, he is cast into the lake of fire. Um, I wouldn't, I'm not talking about the destruction of hell in that sense. I believe that, you know, quite it's difficult to say but i don't want to say it with a dogmatic attitude but when you look at spirit when the idea of spirit spirit is that eternal part of us so i believe that it's it's, it's eternal torment and that's really what the bible sort of gives us that it is a place of eternal eternal torment um so the smoke of their torment is eternal yep yeah. uh it, it's a place uh where I think that if there was this, and I know some people think about this, that it'll just be like a, you know, that's it, lights out, and there's a teaching that has sort of come on the scene, um, and it's sort of a rehearsal of an old teaching that, you know, hell is just this. It's going to be, it's going to be a bit more purgatory style, and then eventually you'll just go to sleep. So people, you know, you, it's not too bad. Well, unfortunately, that's not what Scripture says. That eternal torment, just like we have eternal life, um, I think that you know that's the telling point. But definitely, I think it's going to be Eden esque living. Um, I uh, who was I talking to about this? It was either Pete or Josh, but I was talking to in the sense that. You could be in one place and then instantaneously in another place like when you see in Acts 8 uh, Philip at the side of the baptizing uh, the Ethiopian eunuch and then it, the Ethiopian eunuch looks up and Philip's gone to Azutis and he's he's in a different place miles away and it's that instantaneous uh, ability to move I think with the new bodies and the 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 bodies that I think will be made in the image of how Christ was post-resurrection in the sense that he was tangible but he was also 
ability, had the ability to just appear in a room and disappear and all that, I think it's going to be something amazing. Um, and the thing is, is like I, I, from the comment earlier when somebody says, you know, they, they just don't want anybody left behind. That's one side of me. I don't want anybody left behind. But there's the other side, my spirit, that is absolutely yearning for his coming. Um, you know, just waking up each day and going, oh, is, it, is today going to be the day? And I think that, that that's a healthy balance. You want to be about your father's business. But at the same time, you want to be so yearning for his presence. Because, you know what? If you, Let me finish with this, right? I remember when I got married, looking up the island, we got married in St. Lucia. And I was looking up the island, I was waiting for my wife to walk down the aisle, and I was so nervous, so ridiculously nervous. Like I was shaking, I was, and I, but I was really excited, absolutely excited. And I remember getting to that point that, you know, you're sort of um, jovial, you're, you're kind of like mischievous in the sense that you're so excited and you, you can't stop the giggling. And we actually got told off by the individual marrying us because we couldn't stop laughing we were giggling between each other and i think it's going to be that relationship you know if you're if you're so excited for the coming of jesus you you, you wake up every day with that expectation in your heart to, that your your blessed hope is coming but at the same time you want to get as many people to have that excitement and this is the thing like we can have spiritual attacks day in, day out, but whenever it comes to it, when we focus our eyes upon the Lord, it is so ridiculously exciting. And you start to go, well, nothing else really matters. This is one of the things, and I'll, I'll be honest, this is one of the things that I find as well. When I start talking about the word of God, when I start assuring the word of God, and I, I'll encourage you to do this, I get ridiculously excited because it's like a kid in a sweet shop. My God is amazing. Jesus is amazing. What he has done for me, what he has brought me through, how he has changed my life, how he has blessed me, how he has lifted me from the mary clay, set my feet upon the solid rock. The next part that goes into, he has established my steps, but he's put a new song in my heart. Many will hear it in fear. And this is what I'm saying is when you go out, you want to share. And when you share, it excites you, it lifts you up because what you're hoping to do is to get someone else onto the ark, someone else onto the boat, so that whenever the Lord appears, when he comes like a thief in the night, boom, we're with him. And you're bringing as many people with you. So um, my big screen is finished. My big screen has died. Guys, if there's any comments, just throw them up now. If there was any prayer request, um, let me just type in prayer quickly. Let's see if I, uh, so trust in God, please pray for, um, so, for gary suffering from his morning with severe headaches father god i just thank you for gary lord i thank you that he's a faithful uh follower of you he loves you lord his heart is for you and father we know that you take away all our burdens and we know that we're to bring our burdens to you your word says that come to me all who are heavy laden and you will give us rest so father i just thank you that there is rest in this that there is rest in um gary that he's not finding these pains this this uh these headaches come against him but instead he is set free from it and lord we speak against anybody with ailments right now to be set free in the name of jesus we speak all ailments go in the name of yeshua hamashiach we just speak freedom we speak healing in jesus mighty name amen right i'm trying to scroll down because i can see can you answer my question above um i can't see it can you repost it i'm on the thing is is that my arrow isn't working here bp and e um if you can and somebody's out right like if you just uh, bp and e if you repost your question i'm scrolling back here on my phone to see if i can see it um unfortunately my arrow's now not working um uh oh is it working now all right i'm scrolling down okay 
okay no I'm, I'm way behind here so um guys if you can just give me my, my chat is not but updating here i'm going to come out of this and come back into it um and i'll answer your question uh salvation has said prayer for truth to take root and mark father god i just thank you for seed sown and lord i know that where we where the word goes it does not return void your word will not return void so i speak uh, that the truth that is spoken to Mark, that it takes root right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, yeah, I normally do. I'm able to capture the questions easy enough, but um, I'm having a. I'm, I'm on a laptop, and my bigger computer has just died, so the the smaller laptop is. I guess it's just like we. It's a. A Google Chromebook, so it's a little bit harder for me to see. Hold on. Right. Did you type question at the start? I'm going to type question in again. I can see. Can you answer my question? But I can't see it. BPME. Hmm. Can't see that. Um, you retype the question. Where? Hold on. This is this. This what happened? Um. Yeah, I'll reply to that in a minute. Sorry, I'm getting messaged at the same time from Pete. Um. All I see is the word question here, and I can't see the actual question. So I retyped the question. I can't see the question either. I can't see the question either. I cannot see the question. Yeah, it's just coming up as question and it's blank. If you try and retype it now, just so that you're the last comment there would be, yeah, that's all I see. Um, if you try and retype it quickly, I can do, I can answer it quickly. Apologies, but that's all I can see is the word question. Um, I can see when I share the gospel, I get immediately spiritually attacked. Is that is that what we're talking about? Um, yeah, can't no. There's nothing else I can see there. Yeah, it's not. It's actually not coming up on the system. It's not coming up on YouTube. I don't know if maybe you've said something that YouTube doesn't like, but in regards to being spiritually attacked, yeah, you you do. You know, whenever you share the gospel, whenever you step out for God, you are spiritually attacked. Um, to get to let you know quickly, uh, my wife, uh, who is probably the biggest evangelist I've ever known, she would stand in the queue at any shop and witness to whoever she's whoever's serving her she would uh if you got a like if you have a flat tire or if you need if your car breaks down yet the guy comes out to fix it she witnesses to them she witnesses to she she prayed over someone's dog the other day yesterday um oh here's the question um she prayed over someone's dog the other day and that's the type of witness she is but whenever she um one of the things that we've we've seen is that she's been drastically attacked recently. Um, I can see the question now. Um, she's been drastically attacked recently, and you know, in December she was hit. Her car was hit by a sixteen wheeler, and she almost went into the water. She praised God, the angels around her. Um, in end of January she went in down a phylaxis shock um, and was in hospital then she developed uh, a month later uh, erythroderma which is where the body co it's covered in burns and you can't regulate heat so your heart fails but praise god she's coming through that now but this is the thing greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world first john 4 and we know that and as we know that we know that we can actually stand against the tide of these things that whatever the enemy brings about for evil god's going to use for good so even though things get thrown against you and things come against you 
understand that because you're work, walking for God, he's going to use that for good. He's going to bring you through that. Um, so he's asked, or they've asked, uh, let me see. Do you think that the people will gladly want their heads chopped off before the tribulation, because, uh, because of the tribulation will be so horrific? Oh, good question. Um, I, yeah, probably. I, I The way I liken that aspect of the tribulation, the beheading of the tribulation saints, is very much to um, history and the French Revolution and the guillotine. That people did go to the guillotine kind of nonchalant, knowing where they were going was going to have be so much, I guess, less hard in their mindset than what they were experiencing there. And in that way, for a Christian, uh, specifically for a believer in the tribulation times, for a, a tribulation saint, I reckon, yeah, I think that they would willingly um, seek that release. They know not to harm themselves, but they would willingly seek that release. Now, that being said, um, I think as well, they will be of the same mindset as pre-tribulation believers where they are full of expectancy for the Lord and want to get to the Lord really quickly. But at the same time, they see so many people around them lost, but theirs will be more so. Theirs will be more so. That's why the biggest revival that's spoke about in the Bible is spoken about in these times, in the times of the tribulation, where we will know that there will be a revival. And I think, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think it'll be, yeah, it, you would be like that. And I think even at this point now, there are many people that I say they're weary, that say to me they're weary and they just want the Lord to come back. But at the same time, their heart is, well, I want my, my son saved. I want my daughter saved. I want my cousin saved. I want my, you know, best friend at work saved. And I think it will be that same sort of mindset. They want to meet the Lord. They want to go to heaven. They want to be in that the, the sweet embrace of our Lord and Savior. But at the same time, you know, no man left behind that type of thing so i hope that helps um maybe it would be so horrible in the world at that point so they would rather die remember people seek death but not able to find it yep revelation 9 tormented for five months um but the good news there is that we know that in revelation 9 those that are serving god are marked with the mark of god and they are kept from the torment right if you know where you're going, you're going to have in the next second, I could see that might be a welcome thing. Amen. Well, it's the same as the, the thief on the cross. You know, that promise that today you will be with me in paradise. And I think that will ring through the years of tribulation saints. And I am just thankful. I am a pre-tribulation believer. I know people, some people aren't. I don't believe it's a point of, I guess, division in the church. It shouldn't be. But at the same time, I am um, wholeheartedly, I see in the Bible, I see it biblically, I see it theologically, that I'm a pre-tribulation uh, believer, that I believe the rapture is pre-trib. And as such, I am awaiting with breathless expectation to be taken home. Um, and you know what? I think people will be too during the tribulation. Some people's hearts are so hard that it will take the wrath of God to soften them. Yeah, amen, it will. And there's a, there's a, I, I quoted William Federer earlier, and there's another quote that he actually um, says, and I know it's, it, it, it isn't from him, it's someone else, but it's him I've heard say it. And he says that in times of crisis, people turn to Christ. Um, so that's, that's why I think the harvest, is ready right now um and i don't i i think the thing is is that we have got to be ready to go out and teach the truth the remnant the bible the actual truth of the word of god and not watered down christianity statehood christianity and at the same time i think that'll that'll happen during the tribulation in times of crisis people will turn to christ Guys, I have been on for a while and I was teaching mentoring before this, so I am starving, right? Um, I had a friend who said she prayed to the angels and I asked why she didn't pray to God who created them. She says, no, I want to pray to the angels. Yeah, that is, 
that's more common than you think and it's crazy i know people who have confessed that they they do angel cards and they pray to angels but they don't believe in god in which case my mind just goes i don't know what they're thinking but guys i'm going to love you and leave you i am going to ask you to come on tomorrow night uh i've just had a text from pete it is going to be 6 p.m because the time in america is already daylight savings time it's already changed we don't change till the end of the month um so it's going to be 6 p.m tomorrow which is 1 p.m central standard time so um join us tomorrow we will be going through a lot i get excited for the discussion you know uh we have a lot of i've got a lot of questions and stuff that we're going to talk about um so again do me the favor after this if you can share it if you can comment if you can like guys god bless i call you highly favored of the lord i call you kings and queens and high priests according to revelation 1 6 i call you more than overcomers kings and conquerors and that you can remind you that you can do all things through christ who strengthens you guys god bless